so well I used to feel it too One night I heard a message Of God and all his glory Jesus his son Who died for all my sins And I fell his tap on my shoulder and heard his voice in my mind and all that was was so unclear to his design now I can sense his plan feel my life expand Step on my shoulder long ago. Maybe your life is all that you had hoped for. Maybe you're downright discouraged and fear. you feel his tap on your shoulder and hear his voice in your mind let all that now is so unclear take his design then you will sense his plan feel your life expand I will follow you all of my days. I will follow you all of my days. I will follow you all of my days. And step by step, you lead me. I will follow you all of my days. Follow you all of my days. Follow you. I will seek you in the morning, I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you lead me, I will follow you all of my days, I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days, and step by step you lead me, and I will follow you all of my days, follow you all of my days, follow you God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind.
like springtime on the farm. It's like the sunrise across the water. It's like a baby. I'll be 
Father, with so many promises in the Bible, talk about this eternal glory. Wipe away every tears from our eyes. The sun will not go down. Perpetual light will be wrapped in your love constantly, singing your praises. And then my favorite, I have not seen, nor ear hath not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man that which you have prepared for those who love you. Oh, we can only imagine that. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning and welcome to church here this morning. Very blessed to see everyone. And um, yeah, as my wife mentioned, we are going to have a special time of prayer uh, after service here today, uh, specifically praying for Lon and Barry. Um, as of last night, I talked to Lana via text. I know Barbara and Jim went down and spent time with Barry. At this time, no one's allowed in to see her because her fever keeps coming up. And so they think she could be contagious. As of last night, they were thinking that maybe she might have tuberculosis. They've thought that she also could have valley fever. They also thought that she could have pneumonia, fungal pneumonia. So I don't think it's clear. I don't think they have any quite understanding of exactly what is going on. They've done a biopsy because there was a mass that they saw in her lung 
and a possible mass in her liver, which could be things involved with valley fever and tuberculosis as well. There's nodules in the lungs. So we're not quite sure. Um, they're still running some tests. They won't have the results for the biopsy for 8 to 10 days. But she's still in the hospital now, Bakersfield, and she seems to be in as good of spirits as she could be. I just messaged her this morning and prayed that the peace that surpasses all understanding, that God would be there in her midst and just comforting her. Um, so they're trying to get her to do a, some sort of breathing treatment that would cause her to gag and throw up because they want whatever that is to come out so that they could sample it to see what it is so they could try to maybe treat it more definitely and so we need to continue to keep her in prayer um, she's still pretty ill I think she has a little bit of strength because they're pumping her full of all kinds of stuff trying to knock out whatever it is but we need to make sure and continue to be basking her in prayer and I would even say maybe we need to do a day or two fast on her behalf uh, prayer and fasting uh, and just pleading uh, the blood of Jesus over her. Um, we know ultimately that God is in control. Lana knows that. Um, but I selfishly, I want her to leap out of that bed and, and get back here uh, with her brothers and sisters and her husband and continue uh, using her gifts and abilities to honor and worship God on this earth. And so uh, we need to pray for them. And Barry too, what a trooper. He was down there a couple days staying at a hotel, being close to his honey. And um, so we need to pray for him. As it's difficult uh, being Lana there in the bed, but it's also very difficult for your spouse, for Barry being there watching this and, and not being able to do anything. And so we can pray and we can uh, maybe get a card, a big card or something. And my wife's going to see if they even allow things in the hospital, little tokens, but maybe something just to remind her, which I know she does. She said this morning she did. But to remind her that her church family's here. And uh, we may not be in that room with her, but we're there with her in spirit. Uh, and there is one greater than us in the room there with her, our physician, Jesus. So uh, just keep him in prayer continually throughout the day and um, the night. And uh, we'll just pray that God uh, heals her uh, and she's able to spit out whatever that is. Um, and be done with it and so yeah so it's kind of uh, um, you know trying times and um, Lana's going to be the better for it I have no doubt of that God allows things like this only to grow us in our faith and strengthen us and I pray that there's going to be a miraculous testimony through this to give all of the glory to her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, with that, if you guys want to open up your Bibles, we are going to have a Bible study here today, and it is Communion Sunday. As Jerry, thank you for getting the elements ready for us. We're going to continue our look here at Luke 23, verses 44 to 56, as Jesus is now taking his last breath from the cross and saying to his father there on the cross, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. Where Jesus is now giving up his life as he said he came to do, that no one would take his life, that he lays down his life so that he may take it up once again, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so let's pray here this morning and we'll begin looking at the text. Father in heaven, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you that you are the beginning and the end. Thank you that you are our strong tower, that you are our shield, that you are our buckler. And Father, we just pray and we lift Barry and Lana again as they just are continually in my mind and my thoughts and my heart. And I know my brothers and sisters as well. We again lay her, Lord, at your feet, Lord, and pray, Lord Jesus, that you would first and foremost continue to give her the peace that surpasses all understanding, that she would sense and know your presence not only in that room but in her as well, 
that she is a child of the king. And Father, I pray for wisdom and discernment with the doctors and with the people in the lab and running the test and all of these things, God. I pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment in tracking down whatever this is and doing their best, Father, to treat whatever this is. And as I prayed last week, I pray that even that you would supersede all of that, God, which you are more than able to do. And Lord, you would just touch her miraculously, Lord, and you would remove those things from her body, those impurities, and uh, get them out, Father, that she may be healthy and whole once again. And so, Father, as we examine your word here, Jesus, thank you again and again for what you accomplished there on the cross. The word is that you said to your Father was to die, which means it is finished or Paid in full, meaning that you accomplished the work, that eternal purpose that God sent forth, that the Father sent you forth to accomplish. You did accomplish it. It's paid in full. Your death there on the cross pays for our sins in full, every last one of them, so that we can now be justified before a holy God, that we can now come boldly with confidence before your throne of grace because, Jesus, you have made a way. And so thank you that we can even talk to you right now, God, that we can have access to you right now. We don't need a priest to do so. And even greater than that, as we're going to see here this morning, even greater than us being able to talk to you, God, we can have your very spirit living within us. Something that Jews and Orthodox Jews marvel at today. That we Christians boast in a sense they think. Boast in this uh, idea that we can have God living within us. Although it's not our idea. It was Jesus' idea. He was the one who told Nicodemus, you must be born again. But they marvel at the fact that uh, we can have this kind of access with God. Because they could never have this kind of access with God. They have such great reverence for even the name of God, and yet we declare that we can talk to God openly as much as we want, as often as we want, something that they just cannot wrap their minds around. And so thank you, Jesus, because you fulfill every picture of the temple, of the sanctuary, of the tabernacle. It was all foreshadowing what you would fulfill here on the cross. The temple is no longer needed. In fact, we are now the temple of God because your spirit resides in us. So, Father, instruct us here today. Give us the courage and the strength and the understanding of these things. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. And so let's begin reading here Luke chapter 23 at verse 44. It says, And Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour. And darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw What had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, they began to return, beating their chest. Verse 49 says, And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. So Jesus, remember, is here on the cross. We looked at the scene last week of the brutality and the scourging and all of those things. We see Jesus hanging on the cross now, nailed to the cross. We saw those two criminals that were there being crucified with him. We saw the one criminal who cried out to Jesus, who believed in Jesus. Remember, he said to the other criminal, don't you even fear God? Uh, Don't you know that the same judgment that has come upon this man is coming upon us as well? He said, we deserve being here on the cross. He's confessing and admitting his sin, that he rightfully deserved to be on that cross, but this man, Jesus, did not. 
At that point, Jesus said to that man, he said, today, surely you will be with me in paradise. I believe this man on the cross, we call it today a deathbed conversion, which I implore people to not wait till you're on your deathbed for the conversion because it may not come. The Bible says if you hear his voice today, harden not your heart, and receive him today, today is the day of salvation. But it is possible that somebody there on their deathbed can be converted. It happened to this man. Something I would point out about that criminal receiving Jesus. How did he receive Jesus? Well, we looked at that. He believed. He confessed his sin. But remember what happened before the criminal cried out to Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus actually prayed in verse 34. Jesus prayed and said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. I believe the only way that criminal was saved is because Jesus had prayed for him. Jesus prayed that God would forgive him of his sins. So this man then sees the sign above Jesus' head that says, Jesus, King of the Jews. He believes in Jesus. He believes he's a king, that he has a kingdom. Therefore, Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So as he's now hanging there on the cross again, very near death, the Bible just told us here in verse 40, or 44, that it was about the sixth hour, or 12 noon, that all of a sudden this darkness came over the earth, that the sun was blocked out, or maybe an eclipse darkened the sun so that it was dark all over the land. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is from 12 noon to about 3 o'clock, that there was this darkness. Now, when I hear about these phenomenons in the Bible, I like to trace back to see if there's any other ancient records of them recalling events like this on certain days or times. And I actually came across a Roman historian by the name of Felgonin, P-H-L-E-G-O-N, who in his writing, his ancient writings, recalls on the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, which you know the Romans with their Olympic games, that's how they recorded everything. But he records in his writings that it was the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad that there was this extraordinary, what they would call an eclipse, where the sun was darkened out. Not only did he record that there was this eclipse, he recorded the time of the eclipse of being at the sixth hour, followed by an extraordinary earthquake. So I read things like that and I say, wow, that's fascinating. Not that that's going to bring me to faith in God. I believe God's account before I believe a secular account. But it's interesting to see those things through secular writings. But here's the problem with this being an eclipse. We know the exact day or the time on the calendar of when Jesus is being crucified. Remember, he's being crucified on the Passover, so we know the month. We know the calendar. May I say that during the Passover feast, we're looking at a full moon. It would be impossible for there to be an eclipse with a full moon, naturally. So what am I getting at here? I'm getting at God is doing something supernatural that he's not using nature to do it. May I say, Romans chapter 8, I believe what is happening here as this darkness overcame the land, I would beg to say that all of creation is mourning its creator dying on the cross. How do I back that up? Romans 8. Romans 8 at verse 18 says this, For I consider that the suffering of this present Time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Verse 19. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to the futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to the corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Remember when God created everything in Genesis? And he created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve disobeyed and sinned against God, that that sin brought consequences. It brought curses. Remember, the man was cursed, the woman was cursed, the serpent was cursed, and 
The earth was cursed. This is what Paul's talking about here. The earth is, is moaning and groaning even now for redemption for all of mankind, for you and I, the sons of God, for the return of Jesus Christ, I believe. Remember as Jesus was even there on Palm Sunday entering into Jerusalem and the religious leaders were upset because the people were screaming and worshiping, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The religious leader says, stop this. Jesus, tell them to be quiet. They're blaspheming. And what did Jesus say? If they don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. I believe what we're seeing here in this darkness covering all of the earth as Jesus is being crucified is creation mourning. It's creator. And also probably rejoicing in a way. Because through his death comes redemption. That's what Paul talks about. The sons that we can now become children of God. What a fascinating picture. And so as this darkness comes... We see also, according to Matthew 27, that not only was the veil ripped, but Matthew tells us that it was ripped or rent or torn, and it was torn from the top of the veil down to the bottom. Now, why is this significant? Well, for two reasons. Remember what the veil is. The veil is a 18-inch, 10-inch to 18-inch thick curtain. And this curtain was used in the temple, or before the temple, the tabernacle. And this big curtain hung from the ceiling to the floor and covered it from wall to wall. And what it was is, was a divider. It, it divided the tabernacle, or the temple, into two different compartments. You had the holy place, which would be where the door was, where the priests would come in and, and do their service. Then you had this big thick curtain and on the other side of the curtain was the Holy of Holies. Now this was the place where the presence of God was. Behind this veil was the table of showbread. Behind this veil was uh, the menorah, the golden candlestick, the table of incense, and more, most importantly, the Ark of the Covenant. Now in the Ark of the Covenant would have been Aaron's rod that budded the jar of manna, and the two tables of stone which had the Ten Commandments on them. On top of that ark would have been what is called the mercy seat. Now, this was the place to the Jews where the presence of God was, that man could not go into the presence of God because man was sinful and man cannot stand before a holy God. He would be destroyed. However, God made a provision for sinful man to be able to come through that veil into the very presence of God only one time a year during the time of uh, the Day of Atonement when the priest who would first have to make a sacrifice for his sins, then he could go in and offer a sacrifice and take the blood into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And if that priest made it out alive then the nation's sins were forgiven or were covered for that year. Fascinating with that priest, only going into the presence of God one time a year, only after making a sacrifice for his sins. Because here's the thing, if that priest was harboring some hidden sin and he went into the Holy of Holies, he would be struck dead. And let me tell you, there were occasions where the priest was struck dead to where they started tying a rope around the priest's leg and they would put bells on his outer cloak so that they can hear him in there with the bells jingling. But if the bells stopped jingling, they'd probably give him a couple minutes. And if he didn't respond, they would drag him out with a rope because he was dead. Because you can't stand before a holy God in your sin. So this is what the veil that has been rent now once Jesus Christ is there on the cross and this darkness covers the earth, Matthew says there was an earthquake as also. And it's being ripped from the top to the bottom. So what is this picturing? What is God trying to speak to mankind, to his Jewish people and to the Gentiles as well? Two things here. By him ripping this veil. This was the only way that the people had fellowship with God. This system. 
The system of the temple and the priest and the sacrifice and going into the Holy of Holies and the sprinkling of the blood, it was the only way the people had a relationship with God. And God is now ripping this veil. So God is saying, I am done with this system. This system was temporary. This system is foreshadowing the one who will fulfill this system in totality, who is Jesus Christ. Everything in the temple and the tabernacle points to Jesus. We can do a fascinating study on that. The showbread, the incense, all of it is a picture of Jesus who fulfills all of that. So God, in ripping the temple, as Jesus is paying for the sins of the world, God is saying, you now have free access to God. You don't need this system. You don't need the prince, uh, the prince, the priest to go in there for you. You now, as Hebrews 4, 16 says, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may find mercy. That Jesus has made a way, that he is the way now. He is the only way and truth and life. That no one will be able to come to the Father but through him. Jesus is this way. The second thing that God is signaling to us in this veil being ripped. A, now we have free access to come before God. But also that God does not dwell in temples made by the hands of man. That was never the intention of God building a tabernacle so that he could dwell with his people. God is spirit. And those who worship God should worship him in spirit and truth. The world cannot contain God. You can't put God in a little tent and say, there's God. If your God lives in a box, you're worshiping the wrong God. Our God is an awesome God, the one who created all things. We worship God in this box here, but God lives outside of this box as well. In fact, God lives within us if we allow him. If we invite him in, God can actually live within us. So God is saying that I don't dwell in these temples built by the hands of man. You see, 1 Corinthians 6.19, why I say this is important. Because 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that we now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember when Jesus was talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, when he was telling the disciples that he had to go away and when he's going away to prepare a place. But when he is ready, he will return and and he'll bring them back to that place. And he said, in the meantime, I will pray and ask the Father and he will send a helper, the Holy Spirit. He said that this helper, this Holy Spirit will be with you and he will be in you. Later, the disciples would say he also would come upon you. But Jesus speaking of this spirit being in you, which this is how we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our body, if the spirit of God is in us, then we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So wherever we go, God goes also with us. But I love it even when John, uh, Jesus says this, it's recorded in the book of John, about us now being the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit living within us. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 14. At verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. What is he saying there with abode? Well, it means to dwell. It means to live. It means to make a home. See, God now is aboding or abiding with his people. Those who do what? Those who love him and who keep his word. He comes and Jesus and the Father make their abode with that one. This is the picture, guys, that we don't need the temple. We don't need the priest anymore. The priest doesn't have to go and sacrifice an animal and go through all that process and go in there to cover our sins. Jesus paid the penalty for sins once and for all. By his shedding of blood, the the forgiveness of sins was paid once and for all. He now has become the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so this is what the ripping of that 
veil is speaking of, that Jesus now has made a way for us to freely and boldly and confidently come before God. See, now this is why, and this should bring us to a place of humility also as Gentiles, Christians, all of us, unless you're Jewish here, are a Gentile. I don't care where you're from. We're all Gentiles if we're not Jewish. But it should bring us to a place of, I'll even say at some point, a little bit of shame. Because the Jews, even today, the Orthodox Jews, have such a reverence for God. You see them there at the Western Wall. When we were in Jerusalem, we saw them there. Dedicating hours upon hours of being there at the wall and praying and all of the routines that they try to continue to do and following the law and doing all these things. It's mostly because of a reverence for God. Even still today, some of the traditional Orthodox Jews will refuse to even say the name of God. When they write the name God, they'll leave out the O. Because of the reverence they have for God. Remember, we don't even know the true name of God if it's Yahweh or Jehovah. Why? Because the vowels were taken out. Why? Because they didn't want people to blaspheme the name of God because the name of God was so holy. And so they look at us as Christians in the West, especially in Gentiles, and we talk about how we just talk to God all the time and we pray to God, which is true because of what Jesus did on the cross. But they think, man, you guys are, are blaspheming God. You have no reverence and respect for God. God's going to live within you? How is that even possible? You're a sinner. So maybe that should keep us to walk a little more lightly, understanding the great privilege and honor that we have to have this relationship with God the way that we do. That we could have an abode with God. Those poor Jews, I love them. They are zealous people, but they cannot see Jesus. And without seeing Jesus, you cannot see God. You cannot have God living within you without Jesus because the veil was torn. Jesus is that way. And so though they try and they have such a fear and reverence for God, they do not know God. Their sins have not been forgiven. So I think you and I, that's why I, I think a lot of those Orthodox Jews, I mean, we got some looks when we were in Israel, man. And that's why, because they think that we're so arrogant and pompous walking around like we got this relationship with God. God's my good buddy back here, you know. We're just kind of hanging out with God. What a tremendous privilege we have. Being able to come before His throne of grace. One day, guys, one day we'll truly understand a picture of the throne of God. That we are able, in these little bodies, right here and now, to be able to speak directly to God and God hear us. To come before His throne of grace where all the angels are flying. Angels have been created to only worship God 24-7 around that throne where there's fire and flashes and all kinds of brilliant light. And yet, little old you and I are able to come confidently boldly before this throne of grace because of what Jesus just did on the cross. And God approving it by tearing that veil. God says he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So when Jesus says, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands, verse 46, and he breathed his last breath, He's saying here to Telestai. That is what John 19.30 records. And what does that mean? It means paid in full. We got it right here on our cross. It is finished. Paid in full. So as Jesus says to Telestai, it is finished. Paid in full. And then he yields up his spirit into his father's hand. His body was given to death. His spirit was given or yielded to his father. And so what an amazing thing here in Jesus saying it is finished. What is he saying? He's saying my eternal purpose. The reason why I was born and came into this earth has now been finished. So picture this scene for these two or three hours that Jesus is on the cross. Although I described a very brutal physical beating and lashes and the torture and the, the suffocation there on the cross trying to pull himself up and breathe, as horrible, as horrible as those things were, 
It all fails in comparison to what happens with these three hours on the cross. Somewhere within these three hours, there is a spiritual transaction that is made. You see, Jesus, when he was in the garden, prayed to his father, Father, if there's any other way, then let this cup pass from me, this cup of wrath, the cup of God's indignation. Let it pass. God's answer was, there was no other way, but I will be with you through this. You have to go. You're the only one who could pay for the sins of the world. And so somewhere in these three hours, there is this spiritual transaction that you and I cannot understand. But what happens on that cross is God somehow pouring out the sins of the world, of all mankind, upon Jesus, the one who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Somehow, some way, a spiritual transaction was made there because that's what Jesus is talking about. It is finished. I have taken the wrath of God. I have paid for the sins of the world. It is finished. And only, and only at that point does he then yield his spirit back up to his father. Remember, he said, no one takes my life. I lay down my life that I may pick it up again. Jesus here yielding up his spirit. Amazing that at his last breath, he's even able to speak. These criminals who are on the cross are doing anything and everything they can just to take a breath. And yet Jesus here, somehow, not only able to take a breath, but able to speak is extraordinary. And what does he say? He has to say it. It is finished. Paid in full to tell us die. This amazing spiritual transaction that has taken place. Isaiah talks about this. Isaiah 25, 15 speaks about this cup of wrath very clearly. That says that this cup that Jesus was drinking on the cross is the wrath of God. You want to get a picture of kind of what that spiritual transaction Looked like, well, Isaiah 53, I think, records a pretty good idea for us of how all this happened, because I can't picture this. I can't imagine this. But somehow, in those three hours, it happened that he paid for the sins of the world. Here's what Isaiah 53 says, or Isaiah 50, yeah, 3, verse 3, says, He was despised and forsaken of by men, this is speaking of Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and he was not esteemed. Verse 4 says, Surely our griefs or sicknesses he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. He goes on to say, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. That's why the darkness was overshadowing this, as creation was mourning what was happening to its creator Jesus bearing the sins of the world, the cup of wrath Jesus is drinking here. Why? So that when you and I take our last breath on this earth, we don't have to face the judgment of God because Jesus did it for us. There was a transaction. The innocent one takes the place of the guilty one. What an amazing thing that we see here on the cross. And so Jesus is saying, into your hands, Father, he's saying this work is done He's praying now and yielding his spirit to God and his body to the cross, to the death. And what does he do? Well, he breathes his last breath. Imagine this. Remember when God created Adam. He created Adam from the ground, from the dirt. And so Adam was just a bag of dirt or a dirt bag. I know ladies appreciate when I make that comment. Some ladies, it's sometimes. <laughs> Until God breathed life into that bag of dirt. At that point, he became a living being. So picture this. With one breath, God is starting the whole process. 
God is starting all of this with one breath, and now here we see Jesus finishing everything with one breath. With one breath, he's bringing life, and the other breath, he's paying for the consequences of the sin of that life. What an amazing thing as Jesus here breathes out his last breath. And so what do we see here? The centurion, I love this guy. As he cries out and breathes his last breath, verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. The centurion, who I wonder how many criminals, this guy, that's a Roman guard, how many criminals has he witnessed being crucified through his life? I'm just imagining. But why now, all of a sudden with Jesus, was there something special about Jesus or what was the deal? That now all of a sudden he is worshiping God on behalf of this Jesus. Well, I think John 12.32 says this. Jesus himself says, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. What is happening to the centurion? Through Jesus' death on the cross, he's being drawn to Jesus. Just as Jesus said he would be. You and I have been drawn to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. An innocent man, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, dying for you and I, has drawn you and I to the cross. Just as Jesus said, as I am lifted up from the earth, there on the cross, I will draw men to myself. He's able to now because he's made a way. He's made a way for you and I to now stand in the presence of God, to be born again, to have God himself, his spirit now living within us. And so what an amazing thing. Here you see the centurion giving God glory, but notice all the other passerbyers and and observers. What do they do? Well, they begin to beat their chest and, and walk away sad. Now in Jewish culture, the beating of the chest is just that. It's an outward picture of them mourning. So as Jesus takes his last breath, there's this earthquake, there's this darkness. The centurion comes to faith, I believe, in God, at least worships God, and the other ones are walking away mourning. Why? Well, because I think it's a picture of these people coming to the truth of what they had just done and understanding that what they just did was wrong. Some of them probably were the ones who were yelling, Crucify him! When Pilate said, who should I let go, Barabbas or Jesus? They could have been the ones yelling, crucify him. And now all of this happens, the veils ripped, all of this. The people are like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I think we made a boo-boo. So they're going away mourning, but I'll say this. A godly sorrow brings about repentance. A godly sorrow brings about repentance. So these people having this godly sorrow, that's not the end of the road. There's still hope. Remember, Jesus said these things will happen. But he also said he would be raised from the dead. You see, there's hope. Just because you mourning, because you killed Jesus, or you felt like you did, or you put him on the cross, Jesus said, I died that death so that that sin could be forgiven. What a fascinating thing. His resurrection from the dead means that God accepted that sacrifice. That you and I now can be forgiven. That we can now have the Spirit of God living within us. That we can have a relationship with God. What an amazing thing. They forgot the promise that Jesus said he would be raised from the dead. So they went away away mourning and, and sad. But look at verse 50 here says, and there was a man named Joseph who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, and he had not consented to their plan and action. A man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews who was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever laid. This Verse 54 It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. They then returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And on the Sabbath they rested according to their commandment. 
So Jesus breathes out his last breath after saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. After breathing out his last breath and saying, Father, to tell us die, it is finished, paid in full. Into, my, uh, into your hands I now commit my spirit. He breathes his last breath. And what happens? Well, Joseph, this man of Arimathea, asked for the body of Jesus. I said last week, these criminals who were crucified, once they were dead, they would leave their bodies there on the cross. And they would be devoured by vultures or birds or whatever could climb up there and eat those bodies. And so here this man, Joseph of Arimathea, goes and pleads with Pilate to take that body down off the cross. And Pilate obliges. Notice that it's said of this man, Joseph of, of Arimathea, that he was a member of the council. Do you know what that makes him? That makes him one of those men who are part of the Sanhedrin, which is the council. It is like their religious court system. Uh, there could have been at any one time 70 of these men who would sit on this council who were kind of the, the guys who would determine right and wrong throughout the law. So it says that Joseph was one of these men. Remember, it was that council who condemned Jesus to death, who said he blasphemed there with um, the high priest, Caiaphas. But it also says that this Joseph of, of Arimathea was a righteous man. He didn't consent to the evil that the rest of this court was leaning to. What an amazing thing. He was a righteous man. And so he goes to Pilate. He asks for the body. Pilate gives it to him. He takes it down. He wraps it in cloth and places it there in his tomb. His tomb. And so I think that this Joseph, a couple things. One, I think it's fascinating that this man was prophesied about. You see, Isaiah the prophet tells us in Isaiah 53, 9, two different prophecies, I might add, both pertaining to exactly what we just read. Isaiah 53, 9 not only says that Jesus, or the Messiah, his grave would be assigned with the wicked, which think about how important that is. That's a prophecy. If they would have just judged Jesus and walked him up to Calvary and there was only one cross there and Jesus was crucified there alone, I don't know that that prophecy we could say was fulfilled. Jesus was crucified with other people there, two other criminals, so his grave was assigned with the wicked, yet, I love this, it was, he was with the rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea, who was on the council, was a wealthy man who had a tomb. And he asked Pilate for the body so that he could go lay the body of Jesus in his tomb, probably for him and his family. And what's amazing to me about this Joseph, you know, he wasn't said to be a disciple of Jesus. It wasn't recorded of him that he served Jesus in any way, like Peter and the other disciples. But yet, I find it fascinating that God had a plan and a purpose for this one. What was it? Well, it was to take the body of Jesus and put it in his tomb. May I say this? We all should serve God in whatever capacity we have. This man just had a tomb. <laughs> and he had a heart. So he said, let me take the body and put it in my tomb. What a beautiful thing, guys. But I want to share about this tomb for a minute. Because we know that Jesus was crucified, we read last week, at a place called Golgotha. The place of the skull or Calvary. Now when we were in Jerusalem and we were standing at the Damascus gate, remember there's different gates all around the holy city Jerusalem. We were standing at the Damascus gate and we were looking north. And you are standing on Mount Moriah. But as you look out, you find the highest peak, which isn't that high because you're already at high elevation being there in Jerusalem. But you look to the north from the Damascus Gate and you see this uh, highest peak. And up on that highest peak, almost like it's edged into the mountain, you see this picture of a skull. We saw it. We saw it edged in stone there. It's very clearly, by these days, the nose, I think, had fallen off and it was, it was a little harder to see, but you could definitely see it was a skull. We have pictures of it. 
And it's in the right place. And near the place where the skull is, where it says that Jesus was crucified at a place called the skull, there is a garden. And in that garden that is not that far from the place of the skull is a tomb. Now, I'm not going to say that was the tomb where Jesus was at. But I will say that it was in the right location. And I will say that as we went into this tomb, of course, they're marketing it as Jesus' tomb. And, you know, you got to pay to get in and pay to get out. The Jews, you know, they like making a dollar. You want to believe about this Jesus stuff? Well, we're going to make some money off of it, I'll tell you that. But there is a tomb. And it's a large tomb. It has three or four different compartments in it. So this is a wealthy man's tomb. It wasn't a cave. It was a tomb. Now you're saying, okay, you're going a little too far. Okay, well, let me circle back. This place of the skull, we know we are on Mount Moriah. There is some significance to this Mount Moriah. You see, way back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, we read about Abraham and Isaac being told by God to go to this mountain, Mount Moriah. Now let me say this, all the patriarchs, when they were told to go make a sacrifice on an altar, whatever hill or mountain they were on, because I'll tell you, the, the area of Israel is a ton of mountains everywhere. Jerusalem is the highest mountain. But no matter what mountain they were on, if they were to make a sacrifice to God, listen to this, they had to go to the highest peak of that mountain. That is where you offered the sacrifice to God. You didn't offer it down at the base of the mountain. You went to the peak of whatever mountain you were on to build your altar, to offer your sacrifice to God. That's why I say you can stand in Jerusalem and look to the north from the Damascus Gate and that point where the skull is is the highest point of Mount Moriah which is where the sacrifices would be made, which is where God told Abraham thousands of years before Jesus is there, hanging on the cross, God told Abraham, take your son. May I add, he says, your beloved son. Your only begotten son. Remember, Isaac was a promised child, which, by the way, God brought about the birth of that son through miraculous ways. The wife of Abraham was an old, beyond childbearing years woman. The people mocked and ridiculed Abraham when he kept talking about how God promised him a seed that would outnumber the stars of the sky. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're old, you ain't got no kids. Remember that, Isaac? God says, you take your beloved son, which I will say, John uh, 3.16, and also when Jesus was baptized, what did that voice from heaven say, God? This is my son, my beloved son, my only begotten son. So God tells Isaac, take your son, your only begotten son, your beloved son, the son of promise. Take him up to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Whew. So what does Abraham do? Hey, Isaac, let's get some things together. We're going to go make a sacrifice to God. So they get the mules, they get some helpers, they get the wood, they get uh, the rope, they get the knife, and they're making their way. They tell the servants at a certain point, stay here. They continue making their way to the top of the peak of the mountain of Moriah. And Isaac, being a pretty smart kid, goes, Hey, Dad, um, we're going to make a sacrifice to God. Well, we got the knife, we got the rope, uh, we got the wood. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Whether Abraham fully knew the words he was about to say or not, we will only know when we get there and we can ask him. Look at what he says in verse 8. Abraham says to his son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. I like the King James Version translation a little better because it drops um, the four. It just says God will provide himself a lamb. So Abraham continued to go on up. 
Because God said, go to the top of this mountain and offer your son as a sacrifice. So Abraham ended up binding his son Isaac with a rope, putting him there on the altar and ready to do what God told him to do. Think about the faith of Abraham, by the way, who I believe believed himself that if God was asking him to offer his son as a sacrifice, God was going to be able to raise him from the dead. So what did Abraham do? He raised the knife, the Bible says, and God says, Abraham, Abraham, twice, put the knife down. You passed the test, son. There's a lamb over there caught in the thicket. Go offer that lamb to me. You see, Abraham knew exactly what God the Father was doing with Jesus, his begotten son, there on the cross at Mount Moriah, the same place. The same place where God had Abraham go up to offer his son and God said, stop, I myself will offer a sacrifice. I myself will become the Lamb of God to pay for the sins of the world because no man can pay for the sins of the world. Your son, Abraham, would not be able to pay for the sins of the world. Only my son, who is God himself, sinless and perfect in every way, could pay for the sins of the world. So he says, stop, you passed the test. Thousands of years later, they marched Jesus Christ up to that same mountain where God said he would provide for himself a sacrifice. And guess what? Jesus died as the Lamb of God that God said he would offer for the sins of the world. There where the skull is, there where also nearby there is a tomb. Amazing things, guys, that we can see pictured through all of this. And so Jesus here, this is it. There on the cross is where he was drinking the cup of the Father's wrath that only he could drink to pay for the sins of the world so that it is finished. What an amazing thing that God became man and dwelt among us and taught us more about God the Father than anyone else. And then at the end, what did he do? As he said, he laid down his life so that he may take it up yet again. And so next week, we're going to look at the resurrection. We should be able to finish, finish the book of Luke next week. But you can't talk about the crucifixion without ending with the resurrection. That those people walked away sad. We should never walk away from the presence of God sad. Maybe mourning a little bit, maybe because of some sin. Well, guess what? Confess the sin, repent from the sin, and fellowship will be restored. The joy of your salvation will return. But see, that requires believing in the promise that Jesus was raised from the dead. The people didn't remember that part. They got the part about we blew it, but they didn't remember when Jesus said this was spoken of. So that when I am raised from the dead, you will believe all the things that I said. You will come to faith like that thief on the cross. You will believe in who I am. Therefore, when you receive me and you're born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you're born once to flesh and blood, but you need to be born again. You need to become the temple of God and have the Spirit live within you. Something that the Jews marvel at. I think even non-believers marvel at that because they want to understand exactly how the Spirit enters into your body. Well, I want to know how Jesus drank the cup of wrath for those three hours on the cross. Guys, I can't explain it. <laughs> There's a lot of things I can't explain. But guess what? That is where the transaction happened. When I humble myself before God and I cry out and I confess and repent of my sins, He fills me with His Spirit. And I'm born again and His Spirit then bears witness with my spirit that I am His. How does all that happen? Well, here you go. Close your eyes, raise your hands and say, Father, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. I invite him now to come into my life, to cleanse me, to wash me. And this day forward, I will live the rest of my life for him. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. And it's in your name I pray, amen. And guess what? You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out, just as I am. I don't say that mockingly. I say that seriously. You won't know until you taste for yourself. 
You know, I used to have a buddy back in the day who, <laughs> he was kind of a, he was a different guy, different than me. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'll explain myself. He didn't like going out and, and doing things. He didn't like going out and snowboarding. He didn't like going out and riding a motorcycle. He didn't like going out and golfing, which, what was wrong with that guy? He didn't like going out of the house much at all. And he was perfectly capable and able. And, and you know, we were in our probably mid-20s, bachelor pad. I lived with the guy for a while while I worked with non-Christian. This was my non-Christian days, by the way. But I was always just a guy who liked to go out and see things and do things. My wife will tell you, I love to just go out and do things. But he was fascinated with the computer. He loved living his life through this computer. And I remember one time I told him, you know, hey, we're going to go out and, you know, do some snowboarding or something. You know, you want to go with us? And he would be like, nah, you know, I already know what it's like to snowboard. And I'm like, how do you know what it's like to snowboard? You've never been snowboarding. You never leave the house. He'd say, well, I got a game here on the computer where I can, you know, snowboard. <laughs> so he was experiencing life through this computer but he had no understanding of what it smelt like when you were up there, what that powder hitting your face was like, the sun glistening off that snow. He wasn't able to experience these things because he was living it through a little computer screen. Well, you see, I think many people live that way with a relationship with God. They just look at it through somebody else's life. Well, I would implore people today, I'm speaking to a bunch of Christians here, but who knows, maybe there's one or two here who have been living their lives that way, having that kind of relationship with God. Well, I would say you can experience God in your life. You don't have to have somebody tell you about all the things that he's doing. You can experience these things with him. That is what he desires. He doesn't want a casual relationship with us. He wants an intimate relationship with us. That's when Jesus said that he and I, the Father and I, will make an abode with you. That he will live with you. That's what God desires. That's actually what he created us for. He created us for fellowship that we may worship him. And I'll say, the last thing I'll say, is he deserves our worship. He is worthy of our worship. He and He alone. And so let's worship Him as we go. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word, God, and thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your obedience, your faithfulness, your love for your Father and your love also for us. That you were obedient to the point of death. So Father, I pray that as we picture maybe this scene, even now as we are praying as one, that these prayers are being heard before your throne of grace because your word declares it, not because I say it, because your word says it. That we have access to you even now and these requests are heard. I pray now, Father, you would move in our midst. Lord, that you would strengthen the one who is weak, that you would open the eyes of the one who is blind, that you would open the ears of the one who is dead, that you would soften the heart of the one who's hard. I even pray for Miss Lana again, Father, that you would touch her even now. Your child, you, we know the plans and purposes you have for her. Somehow we don't understand them all. But I pray even now in accordance with your will that you would be glorified and magnified and you would give her the strength and the courage. You'd give her the faith and the comfort because you are, your spirit is the comforter. The peace that surpasses all understanding and Jesus, touch her, I pray. And Father, I pray for anyone else here today who maybe isn't in the hospital but is spiritually sick. I pray that you would touch that one also, that you would cleanse that one also, Father. Maybe the one who's experiencing fear, 
living each day worried about what is going to happen tomorrow. Being trapped in the trap that Satan loves for us to be trapped in. Well, I pray that that one would be set free here today by simply putting their faith and trust in you and laying those problems at your feet at the cross and saying, Jesus, you said it's finished, so I'll trust you with this. Begin to work afresh now, new in somebody's life, I pray. I pray for a relationship that is on its outs right now, God, that you would restore that relationship. I pray for the one who is proud, Lord, that you would humble the one who is proud because we know when we try to exalt ourselves that you will humble us. Father, the one who is straying, I pray that you would bring them back. The one who is thirsty, that you would quench their thirst. The one who is hungry, God, oh, let them feast upon the bread of life. Father, the one who wants to praise and worship, open their mouth. Oh, Lord, I thank you and I know that not only do you hear our prayers, I mean, we're praying as many right now. And you say just by one or two being gathered together, you are there in our midst. So Father, we usher these things before your throne. And we ask that you would move and act upon these things. And we give you all the glory for it because Jesus, you, as we looked at today, you are the one who made a way. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one will come to the Father but through you. And so thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to slaughter animals anymore and go through these routines to have a distant relationship with you. Now, because of what you did, we can actually have you live within us. That the Ten Commandments are now written on our heart. That your Spirit is the one who's leading us and directing us. That we can now grieve you. Grieve your Spirit. A reminder that you are alive and well within us, by the way. I thank you for that great assurance that you won't let us do those things that are unpleasing. You'll make them like rocks in our mouth. You'll make them tasteless. You'll make them empty. You'll make them worthless because you refuse. You refuse to let us settle for second best. You have greater things in store for us. So, Father, spring the trap of the one who's trapped here today. Set the captives free, Jesus. We love you, and we praise you in your name. Amen.